This is going to be Revelation chapter 2, verses 12 through 17. And the title of this is going to be Fearing the Swordsman. Revelation 2, 12 through 17 describes some things about the church in Pergamos. Remember, the churches have more than one application. These were literal churches that were here during John's day. There are also literal churches that will be here in the future, time of Jacob's trouble. We can also get practical application for ourselves by looking at these churches and even learn from their mistakes. And each one also represents a certain time in church history. Revelation 2.12 And to the angel of the church in Pergamos write, These things saith he, which hath the sharp sword with two edges. The one with the sharp sword is none other than the Lord Jesus Christ, according to Revelation 19.15. He has some things to say to the church in Pergamos, and it is very wise to fear the swordsman. We are supposed to fear God. Psalms 111 and verse 10 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. A good understanding have all they that do His commandments. His praise endureth forever. The fear of the swordsman will produce good works in us. If you look at the next verse in Revelation chapter 2, verse number 13, it says, I know thy works. Knowing that Jesus Christ sees us and has our last breath in his hand, we should live pleasing in his sight. A born-again Christian in the church age can't lose his salvation. However, you can lose everything else, your health, your inheritance, your rewards, and everything you have. The church in Pergamos will realize this and know they won't want to face the one with the two-edged sword at the second advent. You should fear the swordsman because he knows where you are and where you dwell. Back to Revelation chapter 2 and verse 13. I know thy works and where thou dwellest. Many times someone may threaten you and say, I know where you live. I know where to find you and I can come beat you up or rob you or whatever else. And many times people give their address on the internet and wicked men show up at their doorstep. It is a scary thing for someone to show up where you live. Jesus Christ knows where you live and he sees inside your house just as if the blinds were opened and the roof was pulled off. At the second coming, when Jesus Christ comes back with tens of thousands of his saints, the saints will enter in the windows like a thief. God knows where all the God-haters live. But the people in the church in Pergamos had good works. They feared God and honored Him. And the next thing we see, a fear of the swordsman will keep you from denying His name. For us born-again believers in the church age, if we suffer for Jesus Christ and not deny His name or the faith, then we will reign with Him in the kingdom. Revelation 2.13 again, it says, I know thy works, and where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seat is. And thou holdest fast my name, and hast not denied my faith. 2 Timothy 2.12, if we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. If we deny him, we won't lose our salvation, but we will lose our reign. For the saints in the time of Jacob's trouble, or tribulation, as people call it, if they deny Jesus Christ and turn to the Antichrist, they will take the mark and lose their salvation. Because the Bible says in the book of Revelation that anyone who takes the mark will go to hell. So they will have a great motivation to hold fast the name of Jesus Christ and not deny the faith. Revelation 2.13 I know thy works and where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seed is. And thou holdest fast my name, and hast not denied my faith. Ephesians 4.27 says, Neither give place to the devil. But in Revelation 2.13 it says, Satan has a seat. So Satan takes up headquarters on earth during the tribulation. It looks like Pergamos will be one of those places. And when we rebel against God, we are basically pulling up a chair for the devil and telling him, that we know you must be tired from walking to and fro, seeking whom you may devour, so here, take a load off and sit here with us in our house. But we don't want Satan to take headquarters where we live, 
but sometimes he does. And similar to how the Pope has the Vatican and the Mormons have Salt Lake City, eventually Satan incarnated as the Antichrist will take a seat in the holy place. If you look at Matthew twenty four fifteen, it says, When you therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place. Whoso readeth, let him understand. Second Thessalonians 2, 4 says, Who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Many of the Lord's people will be sacrificed in a religious worship service by the Antichrist and workers of iniquity. The ones sacrificed will be the ones who hold fast his name and the ones who won't deny the faith. Revelation 2.13 says, Even in those days wherein Antipas was my faithful martyr who was slain among you where Satan dwelleth. Antipas and men like him are the ones who are slain for the word of God and for the faith. Antipas means against everything. That's interesting. The very, his very name means against everything. And God's people are killed because they are intolerant of the sins of man and they stand up for what is right. But I have also heard that Antipas means anti-peace. And Daniel 8.25 explains how the Antichrist by peace shall destroy many. Men will be slain for the name of Jesus Christ by the Antichrist in the tribulation. Fearing the swordsman, the Lord Jesus Christ will provoke his people to keep the faith even when men like Antipas are martyred for the faith. Jesus Christ at the second advent is a lot scarier than the Antichrist. Matthew 10, 28 says, And fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Fearing the swordsman will help them endure persecution. If they fear God more than man, they will endure unto the end and they will make it through this horrible time period without taking the mark, or they will get took out early by martyrdom. Fearing the swordsman will also keep our doctrine straight. Many in Pergamos stay faithful during times of persecution and also apostasy. Revelation 2.14 says, But I have a few things against thee, because thou hast there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed unto idols, and to commit fornication. The verse explains the doctrine of Balaam. Balaam wanted the riches of the world, and he was willing to sell out God's people to get those riches. Balak wanted Balaam to curse Israel, but God wouldn't let Balaam do this. So he told Balak that if he could get the children of Israel to intermingle with his people, then they would give themselves over to idols and commit fornication. Then as a result of this, God would destroy them himself. And this is the doctrine of Balaam. If Balaam feared God, then he wouldn't have taught this false doctrine. Just like today, if a man fears God and loves the words of God, then he won't change the Bible to fit his beliefs. He will adjust his beliefs to fit the Bible. In the time of Jacob's trouble, there won't be hardly any sound doctrine. Even in the last days of the church age, men don't want to endure sound doctrine, as it says in 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 3. And the mega church movement, all the contemporary churches, they have this doctrine. They are shacking up with the world. Men like Andy Stanley will use wicked music to draw in big crowds of lost people to his church. He attracts worldly lost people with the things of this world. And this isn't about reaching people for Jesus Christ. It is about money and worldly riches. Just like the church in Pergamos will mingle with the world, so do these mega churches. They marry the world. And Pergamos means much marriage contemporary music is dangerous and lonely leads to more wicked music andy stanley's church doesn't just play contemporary music contemporary christian they play wicked rock music i've even heard them play the song renegade and they have opened up a service 
singing family sitcom theme songs like the Brady Bunch and Family Matters and Step by Step and all them shows that you used to watch before you were saved as a kid. But what does this have to do with God or the Bible? The problem is people don't care about the Bible. Christians don't care about anything really. And they will watch these sitcoms that this church will sing. They don't care the profanity that it's on it. The average church doesn't have anyone in it who would sit and talk about the Bible with you. And this is why many have resorted to the internet for fellowship with other Bible believers. And I definitely don't down those who fellowship with other believers on the internet. It's better than nothing. And I heard one preacher say he is sick of the internet pastors. But why is that? Could he be jealous? Maybe jealous of the preachers on the internet who have such a large following. And I'm not going to knock down or criticize pastors of local churches. I go to a local church. I have a great pastor. And I'm not going to criticize the preachers on the internet who are reaching thousands of people. I get help from both. And I think Christians should spend more time building each other up than tearing each other down. Maybe they should just quit getting so jealous of each other and realize that if you're a King James Bible believer and you have the right gospel then we're all on the same team. If they have the right gospel and are preaching the King James Bible, then these little minor things that they get worked up about don't really matter. There are times when you have to expose false doctrine, but most of the time when someone criticizes someone, they are just jealous. There are going to be people in this assembly in Pergamos that don't hold the doctrine of Balaam, but many in the church in Pergamos will not be fearing God like they should, and they will have the doctrine of Balaam. Fornication and idol worship will be involved in the religious services. And even today, women go to church dressed up like whores, and men watch pornography at home. And this will lead to sex perversion. This will make Sodom and Gomorrah seem as clean as something like the Andy Griffith show. And that show's not too clean but it's cleaner than what's on tv today and some in pergamos will also have the doctrine of the nicolaitans revelation 2 15 says so hast thou also them that hold the doctrine of the nicolaitans which thing i hate god hates some things and one of the things he hates is the doctrine of the nicolaitans nicolaitans is the clergy over the laity and when a man tells you that, that you have to come to him to know the words of God or to know what God wants you to do, or that he is somehow superior and more spiritual, then that's how you know you're dealing with a Nicolaitan. And it's all about some person over the common people. And this is the kind of leaders that are in the Catholic Church, and God hates this type of thing. And God gave the words of God to the common people. So everyone can know what the words of God say if they just open the book and read it and study it and believe it and pray about it. If you fear the swordsman, then you will respect his sword, which is the word of God. And you won't change the words to teach your own doctrines. Titus 1.9 says, Holding fast the faithful word as he hath been taught that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and to convince the gainsayers. Titus 2, 1, But speak thou the things which become sound doctrine. You shouldn't fear your pastor or religious leader. The one to fear is the one with the sword. Jesus Christ is the final authority, and he has given you the Bible to know what he wants you to do. Now we have a warning from the swordsman. Fearing the swordsman will produce a motivation to repent of wicked deeds and beliefs. Revelation 2.16 Repent or else I will come to thee quickly and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. If the men with the bad doctrine don't repent, then they will face the sword. Those who do overcome will get some rewards. Moving on to verse 17. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the hidden manna, and will give him a white stone, and in the stone a new name written, which no man knoweth, saving he that receiveth it. 
Notice the verse said, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. And many times people just won't give ear. Second Chronicles 24.19 says, Yet he sent prophets to them to bring them again unto the Lord, and they testified against them, but they would not give ear. We are living in a time when people's ears are full of earbuds and skull candy and Beats headphones. They are filling their mind with the top-selling iTunes songs. And it's hard to hear with those things in your ears. The kids have those things in their ears and they are being indoctrinated by devils every time they listen to a song. And they are being entertained by devils that are thousands of years old. And those devils are possessing rich men who are deceiving and being deceived. While they are deceived themselves, they are deceiving your kids at the same time. And earbuds can be used for good just like anything else. You can listen to the words of God. There's audio Bibles like Alexander Scorby. There's all kinds of preaching on the internet. The amount of Bible preaching on the internet is unreal. You can find sermons from any preacher almost that's free. And we have the word of God with 24-7 access. So we should take advantage of that. But the Jews in the time of Jacob's trouble are going to need food from God. And if you go back to Revelation chapter 2 and verse 17, it says, To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the hidden manna. And just like God fed the children of Israel in the book of Exodus with manna, the small round things that fell from the sky, the Jews will need this in the time of Jacob's trouble because without the mark of the beast, they won't be able to buy and sell or get food. They will need manna, and it will have to be hidden manna. So the Antichrist and his henchmen and the, the workers of iniquity won't know about it. So that is what verse 17 is referring to when it says hidden manna. The faithful saint in this time period is also going to get a white stone and a new name written in the stone. This hints of nicknames for faithful saints, similar to how God changed Abram's name to Abraham or Saul to Paul. There's all kinds of times where God gives a person another name. And they will be so close and in good favor with God that these saints will be on a nickname basis with God. And the white stone, I'm sure, is connected with the living stone, which is Jesus Christ. These tribulation saints are going to have to overcome in a different way than church-age saints overcame. We overcame by believing the gospel. 1 John 5, 4 through 5 says, For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Who is he that overcometh the world, but he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God? We overcome when we believe the gospel. We believe the gospel of the death, burial, and resurrection. In 1 Corinthians 15, 3, it says, For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Jesus Christ died. He died by shedding his blood. He was buried and he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. If you want to be saved, you have to put your faith in that gospel to save you. Rely on that, just like you're relying on that chair to s sit you up. You put all your trust in the gospel, not in your good works. Romans 4, 5 says, But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Ephesians 2, 8, 9 says, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Titus 3, 5 says, Not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us, by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. We can't be saved by our good deeds. Uh, all the good works that you do can't get you to heaven. So what you need to do is realize you're a guilty sinner. Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There is none righteous, no, not one. Our righteousness is as filthy rags. You can't make it on your own because you're a sinner. 
and you need a Savior because you're a sinner. The Savior is Jesus Christ, the one who said, I am the way, the truth, the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. So if you want to be saved, look at Acts 16.31. It says, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved.